of the earth and the far corridors of history. Dateline, World War II. December 1941, North Africa, commanders of the British Eighth Army are flush with victory. Operation Crusader has succeeded in relieving the besieged port city of Tobruk, forcing Rommel's Africa Corps, which has had a stranglehold on the city since early April, to withdraw. Despite their success, the men of the Eighth Army are too exhausted to revel in victory. Rommel's outnumbered troops have fiercely contested the British advance. Relying heavily on surprise and mobility, the Africa Corps only fights when they have a tactical advantage. Rommel's use of 88mm anti-aircraft guns against British armor has been devastating. They watch helplessly as their outgun tanks are picked off one by one before they ever have a chance to fire a shot. Their effectiveness has caused the British advance to be slow and cautious, allowing the Africa Corps to withdraw intact. For men on both sides, surviving in the harsh Libyan desert is a tough enough battle. Bitter cold at night, sweltering heat under the midday sun, sand in everything, the desert wears at the men. Although the Germans have inflicted heavy losses on the British, they too are bloody. At one point, the two Africa Corps divisions are down to 40 battle-ready tanks. Despite their losses and the fact that they are retreating, German morale is still very high thanks largely to their devotion to and belief in Rommel. Frequently showing up unannounced right on the front lines to lead his men, the Desert Fox reassures them that they are not beaten and will have their chance to strike back. Even as the British pursue him across the desert, Rommel's situation begins to improve. As he moves west, his supply lines become more secure. The Luftwaffe, under orders from Hitler, is stepping up its efforts to gain control over the Mediterranean, allowing more supply ships to safely deliver their cargo to the Africa Corps. As Christmas nears, Rommel has fallen back almost to the point where he began his whirlwind offensive in March. Defeated less by British military prowess than by his own supply problems, he is determined to regain the lost territory. He realizes that Tobruk is the key. In any future action, the port city must be taken quickly to avoid a prolonged war of attrition. As for the British, they are watching Rommel with a wary eye. They realize his forces are growing stronger with each passing day, and that at some point, he will once again go on the offensive. The problem they now face is trying to predict when and where the cunning desert fox will choose to strike. to December 1941 Leningrad in hopes of lifting the spirits of the citizens here party leaders announced that the food ration will be increased henceforth all workers will be allowed 100 grams of bread approximately one slice per day those who do not work will receive 75 grams Leningrad like all of Russia was taken off guard by the Nazi blitzkrieg and with those in charge either unwilling or unable to accept the possibility that the enemy might actually march this far, little was done to prepare for the defense of the city. Certainly, no one expected the Germans to advance as quickly as they did. So it was on 15 September when, a mere four months after their first attack, the Germans severed the last overland connection between Leningrad and the rest of Russia, that authorities were shocked to find that the city's warehouses contained barely 20 days worth of flour, sugar, cereal, and meat. Immediately, 
All available food was commandeered and ration cards issued. The starvation of Leningrad had begun. The situation was made worse by the continued attacks of the Germans. Even after the decision had been made in Berlin to cease attempts to break through the city's defenses and starve them into submission, artillery shells continued to fall daily. Tens of thousands were killed, struck down by the explosions or buried underneath fallen buildings. Rescue workers, their strength consumed by hunger, were increasingly too weak to rescue those trapped in the debris. In addition to being cut off from food, Leningrad was left with no way to replenish stores of military equipment and ammunition other than manufacturing the supplies themselves. Workers, living on starvation rations and freezing from lack of heat, worked until exhausted to maintain the city's defenses. Time and again, food rations were cut from two-thirds of a pound of bread daily at the beginning of November to two slices by month's end. Sawdust was mixed with flour, depleting the nutritional value of the bread. Twigs and bark, dogs, cats, even rats and mice were consumed by the suffering populace. As the weather grew colder, Lake Ladiga began to freeze. Desperate to get food into the starving city, authorities began to construct a road over the ice. On 21 November, the first trucks rolled across the lake and delivered 33 tons of flour to Leningrad. And while the city would require over 400 tons daily just to maintain starvation rations, it was a start. Now, as the new year approaches and party leaders try desperately to keep the spirits of the populace up by increasing the rations, nearly 4,000 people a day succumb to starvation. Yet through it all, they refuse to give up themselves or their city. Stubbornly, perhaps to some foolishly, they stand fast in the belief that in the end, it is better to surrender to death than tyranny. The attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent assaults on U.S. forces in the Philippines may seem to Americans previously isolated from the war in the Pacific like acts of aggression purely against the neutral United States. But it is becoming apparent that they are simply one aspect of a much larger Japanese plan. All around the southern and western Pacific, the Japanese have moved forcefully to expand their reach and consolidate their control. The day after Pearl Harbor, the Imperial forces attacked Guam, Wake Island, and the Gilbert Island chain. Japanese troops step up the pace in Burma, on the Malayan Peninsula, and throughout Indochina. At particular risk are the colonial holdings of European countries, especially those of the British and Dutch. Already busy with war closer to home, they lack the power to hold their distant outposts, which are strung across the Pacific Rim. The colonial powers hold these territories not just as a symbol of their status in the world, but because the colonies are economically important. That is clearly on the Japanese mind as they mount an attack on the island of Borneo a possession divided between the British and Dutch. Borneo sits atop one of the world's deepest pools of oil, a resource that the Japanese need desperately if their military and economic expansion is to continue. In quick consultations, the British and Dutch decide that a Japanese landing on Borneo, which is rimmed with gently sloping beaches, seemingly made for amphibious assault, cannot be prevented. The order is given to destroy the oil fields the Japanese covet and to fall back around Kuchin Airport, the most strategically important site on Borneo. By 16 December, 
The Japanese have landed and rapidly take control of the island. In the meantime, another rising sun force is closing in on the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. An intensely urban and isolated city-state that is in many ways the linchpin of British holdings in Southeast Asia, to the Japanese, it is just another pearl in the Chinese necklace. By 14 December, Japanese troops operating from the mainland have pushed to the outskirts of town across a short strait from the main city. The Japanese lob thousands of artillery shells into the city. Those areas that are not reachable by cannon are targeted by aircraft. In scenes eerily reminiscent of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese aircraft swoop down in groups of 12 over the city's harbor, crippling shipping and virtually guaranteeing that the colony, defended largely by Canadian troops, will not be reinforced. Canadians, badly outnumbered and suffering devastating losses, nonetheless hold on. By 24 December, it is obvious that the end is near. And on Christmas Day, the defenders of Hong Kong surrender. Back on Borneo, Christmas Eve brings a Japanese convoy. Though British artillery manages to sink several Japanese landing craft, the Japanese land and move inland. Kuchin, the airfield that only two weeks before was the place where Great Britain had decided to draw a line against Japanese aggression, falls. The planes on its runways are flown to safe havens behind the lines, and the troops that had been positioned to make a hold at all costs stand begin to pull out. On 26 December, British Borneo falls. The British troops on the island are driven over the border into Dutch Borneo. It says much about the status of the colonial powers that a colony of a nation that is itself occupied by foreign invaders is the safest haven the British can find in Southeast Asia. From all appearances, this Second World War will likely be decided more in the air than any war in history. The Nazis have taught the world a devastating lesson, that air superiority is all superiority, and that while no battle is won until the ground is taken, it is not possible to take that ground without first taking the air. It is the fighters, allied and enemy, that will ultimately decide the issue of air superiority. They will accompany or turn back the bombers that will be the ground forces' torment. They will search and strafe and harass, inevitably becoming key players in the war of aerial attrition. As the war begins, America's primary fighter is the P-40 Warhawk, manufactured by Curtis Aviation. With a top speed of 364 miles an hour, it is slower than the Focke Wolf 109, Germany's best fighter. It is also less agile than the Japanese Zero, a distinct disadvantage in a dogfight. But among the pilots who fly the Warhawk, it has a reputation as a tough plane to kill. The pilot sits against an armored bulkhead behind a bulletproof windscreen. The wings are studded with 650 caliber machine guns that can be focused to converge along a killing line hundreds of yards long. What the Warhawk most lacks what all Allied fighters lack at this juncture is range. Even with the optional belly tank, the Warhawk in combat has a normal range of barely 600 miles, not enough to accompany bombers on their long distance missions behind enemy lines. Even as production of Warhawks increases, however, the Air Corps is also bringing on a new generation of fighters that are faster, pack more punch, and hopefully are the equal of anything the enemy can field. Closest to deployment, is Lockheed's P-38 Lightning. Designed in 1937 as a high altitude interceptor, the P-38 captured the public imagination when it flew from California to New York in only seven hours. The transcontinental record, while impressive, was overshadowed by the fact that the prototype crashed on arrival. 
A complete structural redesign followed. The plane that is emerging from that troubled development is impressive. It is lighter than the prototype, more agile, with more fuel capacity and armament. It carries four 50 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon and has a top speed nearly equal to the Fock Wolf. P-38s by the hundreds should be rolling off assembly lines by mid-1942. Not far behind is the P-47 Thunderbolt, a high-powered pug of a plane designed primarily for speed in battle. Conceived as a lightweight interceptor, it emerged from development as a heavy fighter capable of both escort and attack missions. Test pilots quickly named the P-47 the Jug, its distinctive blunt shape is the result of its huge air-cooled radial engine. While most fighters today use longer, more aerodynamic engines, the Thunderbolt's 18-cylinder monster pulls it along at 440 miles an hour. The first Thunderbolts rolled off the production lines as the bombs fell on Pearl Harbor. By the end of 1942, they should be a familiar sight overseas. Finally, there is the P-51 Mustang. Designed to British specifications, Mustangs are currently being tested with limited success on both sides of the Atlantic. It is, at high speeds, underpowered and sluggish. The British, who have taken possession of the first production run of Mustangs, are tinkering with the plane, trying to save it. The United States, disillusioned with the plane, has redesignated it for low-level reconnaissance. Ultimately, the new planes will have to prove themselves in battle. Their opportunity for that will come very soon. If they are successful, it will say much about the ultimate outcome of this war. Eight December 1941, Washington, D.C. Following the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and President Roosevelt's impassioned plea for a swift and sure response, the United States Congress declares war on Japan. This move, while certainly proper and probably unavoidable, sets in motion a series of responses that will take this conflict from an isolated action between two parties into the realm of worldwide conflict. Like political dominoes, alliances and treaties spur a string of declarations that stretch from the momentous to the absurd. On the same day as the U.S. declaration, England, in a show of support, declares war on Japan, as do Canada, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. At the same time, South Africa declares war on Japan, Finland, Romania, and Hungary. China, not wishing to be left out, declares war on Germany, Italy, and Japan, while Australia proclaims itself at odds with Finland, Hungary, and Romania. Elsewhere, Cuba, Guatemala, and Panama all declare war on Japan. On 10 December, the nations of the world, perhaps out of breath from all the declaring they had done the day before, seem ready to let the dust settle, but on the 11th, Hitler initiates a new round of proclamations. In a somewhat surprising move, Germany declares war on the United States. In a speech to the Reichstag, Hitler proclaims that it is Roosevelt who is responsible for plunging the world into global conflict and states that the Third Reich has little choice but to bear arms against the tyrant. Many people are shocked that Hitler has taken this step. Despite their declaration against Japan, the Congress has remained hesitant about getting involved in the European conflict. If the United States were to remain neutral in Europe, Germany would have only Russia and Great Britain to contend with. But with Hitler having crossed the line, the reluctance of the Congress melts away, and the United States officially declares war on Germany. This, in turn, spurs a whole new round of declarations. Italy declares war on America. The Dutch government in exile declares war on Italy. The Polish government in exile declares war on Japan. Costa Rica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Nicaragua all declare war on Germany. As December rolls on, so do the declarations. Bulgaria declares war on England and America. South Africa declares war on Bulgaria. The Belgian government in exile declares war on Japan. Haiti declares war on Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. And the Czech government, perhaps to save time and cut down on paperwork, declares itself at war with any country at war with England, 
Russia, or the United States. So it is that as the new year begins, nearly every nation in the world has declared its intent. If it was not before, this is now officially a world war.